right, well, it is good to see you this morning. And we have some that are out due to whether it's the weather or surgeries, cars going kaput, those things happen. But we're going to continue in our series this morning. Uh, just a few more lessons, as a matter of fact, uh, in the doctrine of imputations. And we're talking about, still talking somewhat about the crown of righteousness. It's uh, it's the one that Paul speaks of in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So just for a moment, I'll direct your attention there. Uh, we've uh, been over that verse uh, by language and by doctrine uh, on two different occasions now. But it is significant because it involves something that you are able to qualify as I am to qualify for. And it has eternal ramifications and so often I think we're so attuned as human beings to the things that have temporal ramifications that we overlook the eternal aspect of our choices and our, our um, focus. It's only normal that we would, but we're Christians, so we're not normal. We're not expected to think the way the world thinks. Our God thinks higher than the world thinks. His thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. And he's always trying to pull us up into his way and his thoughts. And uh, his word certainly brings that uh, to bear. But our volition to follow that and to stay in fellowship so that we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit rather than the sin nature, our, uh, that, we need that influence from him. We definitely need that influence uh, from the Lord. Meaningful worship is what I uh, entitled this lesson, and I think you probably have a bulletin there. It has a few few things in it uh, that uh, we have as questions. I used to email these out, but uh, a lot more interest was in some of these things, and I think some people got back to church after COVID scare, and uh, the knowledge of all that was going on was flushed out of that mess. Uh, so... Um, I had it. I didn't die. Many of you had it, didn't die. Uh, you survived. Some of you have had shots. Some of you have not. Uh, but uh, I'd say that the truth of the matter is uh, we've fared pretty well, and we always look at ourselves as living within the providence of God, not government. And so we trust God for the things that uh, we have. We try to keep our health up. We try to keep especially our spiritual health up because that is significant uh, to our eternal rewards. We want to keep our academic health up because 2 Peter 3.18 commands us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, uh, knowledge is important. Obviously, L E D G E. That's obviously uh, important, uh, Second Pete uh, 3 and 18, but growing the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a present uh, active imperative verb, and uh, that verb is for the word G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, which equals academic understanding that's what that word means it means that you first have to receive the knowledge then after you've received the knowledge then it's up to you and I as to not whether we're going to accept the knowledge so this is knowledge in what is known in the mind as the noose or the ability to comprehend in the left lobe of the brain versus in the spiritual realm to the right side, which is the cardia. And the cardia, K-A-R-D-I-A, -A, the cardia, which is the functioning side or the exhale side. So once it becomes in the cardia, then it becomes epignosis. Or E P I G N O S I S. And epinosis is prefix preposition, which means higher, to have a higher 
knowledge, a spiritual knowledge. So we are commanded in 2 Peter 3.18 to grow in the grace and in the academic understanding of the word. Well, a lot of churches, academia is scorned upon because it's looked at as being cold. But you don't graduate in high school because you were good at the pep band or the pep rally. You graduate because you understood the academics of your classes. You may not have been perfect. I may not have been perfect. And uh, I didn't actually expect perfection of me or anyone else. It was all about uh, either from I was a younger kid, keep from getting a licking for not studying or for not trying. Or as I went into high school, I wouldn't be able to play sports if I didn't at least keep a, mat, a C grade anyway or a C plus. So that was my motivation. <laughs> so I could wrestle, play football, and run track. And, uh, well, I guess I need to get on around the bend on this track here. Meaningful worship. Basics number 541. Uh, and this is... Uh, our study this morning. We're talking a little bit more about the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, not for me only, but all those all those that love him at his appearing. He that word henceforth, as I said, points back to verse 7, which follows that I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith. I didn't give up on the good fight, I didn't give up on the course. And I didn't stop guarding the faith, first of all, in my own heart. I stayed true to it. I learned it, and I stayed true to it. And as we have opportunity, we share the faith. And I don't just mean the gospel. It's the faith, the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not just the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Paul told the pastors at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 to do not fail to teach the whole counsel of God's word. I've spoken to several people since we began this section of the series on imputations regarding eternal rewards. I spoke with a, a salesman yesterday and he said that most of the people that he comes in contact with that are interested in church and such has become so minimal in the last decade that they used to buy commentaries from, you know I'm talking about their local uh, Bible sale, book salesmen and scripture sales of different uh, biblical uh, materials. That people used to buy commentary sets, they used to do this, they ordered them to have for college, they used to buy more language books, more history books that dealt with the isagogics of the study of the context of the passages of scripture that people are now more or less going to devotional books and trinkets and things of that nature rather than hardcore study of the word and so I've talked to the fellow about an hour and I've known him for years anyway and we had a good little talk and I, I enjoyed speaking with him he's fairly well versed in the, in the Bible as well not just in sales of books you know so I enjoyed, enjoyed that talk with his brother and his father son as well so that was a good experience. But so few people have a, even a concept of what we're talking about. You and I, we take it for granted, but there are so few churches that even touch this subject. It's like God is a socialist, and everybody gets the same size tater in their pot. It's not that way at all. We had to have, we should have, God gives us the written word so that we will have a reasonable understanding of what to expect. You're not going to turn into an angel. You're not going to be somebody else. I know some people are disappointed with that, especially for other people, not themselves. You're going to be you. Your personality is going to be you. You won't have a sin nature, and your knowledge will just explode in your thoughts and your heart, but it will go automatically to this. All knowledge that we learn when we get to know the Lord, when we get to heaven, None of it has to stop at this anymore. It will all go directly to spiritual knowledge. Because there will be no, you won't have any, you won't, your sin nature will not challenge your understanding. Right now, the reason why people don't have a lot 
of the spiritual side where it creates the conscience of a Christian is because their sin nature argues with what they understand. People argue with what they know. That's why some churches don't teach the Pauline epistles because they argue with the theology of the Apostle Paul. Not accepting the fact, as it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, as you see right there in your Bible, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, including what God gave Paul, including the Old Testament scriptures, which all graphe is the word there. He primarily was pointing to the Old Testament to find because the New Testament hadn't much been written. Anyway, the crown of righteousness is not for those who come become exasperated with life's trials, because we all have them, and then give up on the faith. You and I are tempted sometimes to give up on the faith, and we will give up on the faith and the pursuit of it, of the, the word of God, if we let life's trials get us so frustrated that we just throw up our hands. If you focus on your trials instead of on the word, you and I will throw up our hands. So we're not to give up on the word, because giving up on the word is giving up on the faith. And it's putting your faith in your answers and my answers. And we need God's answers. There are a lot of believers who are thrown in the towel. They have what we know is give up itis. They have adopted a whatever will be, que sera, sera mindset. And that, that attitude is, well, I guess I'll just get lucky. No, you won't. That's the deceit for the old sin nature is that God's going to overlook my arrogance. No, he's not. It's going to be the problem. God's going to overlook my ignorance. No, he's not. That's going to be the problem. And Christianity is, just, is all about activity rather than thought. Better think before you jump. Christianity has jumped off the cliff without thinking about the consequences of the crash. It takes decades for the crash to happen, but the crash will happen if we don't think rightly. A lot of believers have the give up attitude. They've thrown up their hands as if they're surrendering to God in some of the churches, but it's not a surrender to God. It's that they have surrendered to their circumstances. And they're asking, as Carrie Underwood did in her song, Jesus, take the wheel. Well, I hate to say this, but you're the idiot with your foot on the gas. You're the idiot that has your foot on the brake. You're the idiot that won't slow down when you see difficult troubles coming. You're going right into it. Jesus is going, to, is going to take the wheel. Well, he's going to crash the car then because that's the only way some people will wake up. <laughs> like I say, Jesus take the wheel, but I'm not taking my foot off the gas. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Jesus take the keys. <laughs> it's more like it. <laughs> But many believers have surrendered to their old nature, their old sin nature, that has led them down a path of give up itis. That's a, that's a sad thing. Some examples of giving up on the word of God is, well, what, saying that whatever will be, will be. Or showing that you have a selfish, fatalistic attitude. That whatever serves me best is what I'll go with. That must be the will of God. No. Or some have chosen to be neutral with their circumstances with the hopes that God will do a flyover and will pass them by. Good thing the Jews didn't feel that way when the, they were told to put the blood over the lintel of the door and the doorpost because the death angel would have socked the firstborn of their family. You can't be uh, non-committal if you're a born-again Christian because you are committing an act of treason and an act of actually spiritual suicide. Not loss of salvation, but you're just giving up on something. Don't do that. That's a, that's a, the seed of the sin nature. That's not an act of faith. It's cowardice and blatant defiance to have a give up attitude or I don't care attitude. And also, also one of the things that um, an example of giving up on the word of God is that we give over to our feelings and forget faith. We give up on our feelings and forget the faith or the word of the Lord. We can't live by our feelings. This is not an act of obedience to Christ. That's an act of mutiny. 
a lot of people have tried to create mutiny within the church and giving over to emotional revolt and to activities that are not biblical or theological. And it's an attempt to take over the helm of the ship when we do not trust the one who steers us through the rough waters of life. Look, if the Lord takes us through the calm waters, he'll take us through the rough waters too because he always has the navigation set for the right course. And yes, the course will take us through rough waters. That's just the way it goes. And often, sometimes when we think things are too calm, we get into trouble because we think we're not getting anywhere when we're exactly where we need to be to steady us for the storm that's coming. When it's calm, it's not time to jump ship. It's time to learn, to grow, to cinch up because you're going to have to meet storms head on out at sea if you're going to get to your destination. That's the way it works. But brethren, we may qualify for that wonderful crown of righteousness so long as we remain faithful to the word, finishing the course and keeping the faith. Especially when the word corrects us. As I said before, this is where we have an issue with gnosis becoming epinosis where we know to do good, but we do it not to him that is sin. That's a passage that we understand as well out of the book of James. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. In other words, I understand what I should be doing, but I, my old sin nature is leading me to think I know best, and so it never becomes a spiritual knowledge, and we lose confidence in God, and we fool ourselves. We must confess our sins when we're wrong and humbly move forward in faith. All of us do. There's no crown for giving up because life gets hard. The crown is for staying faithful, especially when life gets hard. And as I said, the crown of righteousness is most uh, earned in staying faithful. Not being talented or being uh, wonderful, but being faithful. The believer who's physically and geographically able to go to a local church that teaches the word, but refuses to do so, has abandoned biblical worship for their own self-style of worship. And they are not staying on course for the crowns. Remember what Paul said. Remember what he said. Let me bring this out here again. In chapter 2, verse 5, if a man strives for the masteries, he is not crowned except he strives lawfully. And the issue of crowns comes out in chapter 2. He's using the word masteries or the Olympics. And the example is given. He's not crowned, or he or she is not crowned except they strive lawfully. That is according to God's standards or his rules. And so if I have abandoned biblical worship, I have abandoned my pursuit of the crown of righteousness. And Paul was looking forward to it. He was pursuing it. The Lord had demonstrated it, shown it to him. He had pursued it. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And the word again, laid up, is a present passive indicative verb, which means that passive voice means I receive the crown Present tense, I continuously seek after it, and the indicative mood is, a mood is of that same word laid up, one word, is that I will receive it. I have no doubt, because the Lord told him how he could get it. And he told him in verse 7 how he could get it. Fight the good fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. We cannot afford to stop guarding or keeping the faith. This is especially true if the believer has a local church where they can receive the word of God for edification, correction, and encouragement, but leave it for entertainment. This has happened here and it's happened to other churches as well. This is part of the apostasy of the latter part of the church age where believers will leave a doctrinally oriented church for an entertainment oriented church. It's, it is prophetic of the age. That's why I don't go off the cray cray when people leave a doctrinal church because it is prophetic. It is expected. Unfortunate. But it is expected. Like it said, uh, yeah. Second Thessalonians says it's going to happen. 
Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I mean 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says it in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But he also says it in 2 Thessalonians 2, Be not soon shaken in mind, be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as the day of the Lord is present. It, has, it hasn't come yet. And let nobody deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the day of the, of the uh, revealing of the Antichrist, and that day will not come except first there is a great the falling the falling away, and the definite article the is used now. There's apostasy or falling away from the word all the time by folks, but this one is preceded by the definite article, which refers to a specific prophetic time of the apostasia. That's the falling away word there. And then that man is seen as revealed. Well, the, before the rapture of the church happens, there will be a great falling away of the faith, not a great falling into the faith. And I'm cognizant of that. I'm not encouraged by that because every dispensation ended in a judgment. And a new one began. Every dispensation ended in a judgment. And the church age will end in a judgment. The judgment of the church age is not the tribulation period. That is the judgment of the dispensation before. The judgment of the church age is that we could not go on to honor the God as we should have as the body of Christ. The percentages of positive believers became so narrow that he took us out. And then we go on. He rewards the faithful. He takes the rewards away from the unfaithful. A lot of people just like to look at it from their own perspective, but every dispensation whether you're in the dispensation of innocence in the garden or from conscience or you're in the dispensation of promise, the dispensation of the law, or the dispensation of the church, the dispensation of the millennium will end in a judgment. It's prophetically only a thousand years, though. We understand it. So God and overall shows us that it's only by his grace and mercy that he allows us to be in his royal family, but he also shows us what kind of a royal mess we are as depraved human beings because of the fall of Adam. God is so good and so gracious to let us be included in his royal family. But he's also merciful, he's patient, and he allows us who want to stay in the word to honor him as much as we possibly can. And I think that's a great, a great honor for all of us. But the believer who stays away from the word to grow has abandoned any hope of eternal rewards because they do not intend on keeping God's course. Now think about that. You may be entertaining, worthy, you may be talented, you may be gifted by God, saved, I'm saying. You may have all of the things that are the things that you check off of a box at what the world quantifies as a successful person and not get a dead gum thing at the beam of seat of Christ because that led you to believe that you were worthy of something and you could skate on what is the right course of action according to the scripture, playing and shooting the ball from out of bounds, not getting credit for it. There are a lot of believers who will not get any credit at the beam of seat of Christ because they have taken on their own prescribed course. Good deeds, the unsaved do good deeds all the time human good. And as a Christian, not everything that we do is of divine good. If we are out of fellowship with the Lord, if we are walking according to our own path, our own prescribed course of action, if we are shooting the ball out of bounds, I don't care how pretty it is and what kind of quantified results you get, it does not count. We can do good deeds, but if our deeds are not done as we're keeping the course, then we have told God, you know, God, you don't know what you're talking about. Your word is not right for me. I'm going to go my own course. And that happens to a lot of believers. Many forsake the local church because they've been jaded, you know, overworked, and hurt, disappointed. I've talked to so many people up and down these ridges and hills over here over the years that they were jaded. They were either worked to death and not taught anything. They were cheated on, they, this and that and the other. And so they have just thrown in the towel. And they have justified in their own thinking that this is okay. Do they realize that they are forsaking the <coughs> eternal rewards at the beam of seat of Christ because they can't get over their pride? They won't let the word of God heal their hurt? 
that their plans are better than that of God. They refuse to humble and submit themselves to receive the word from a place that God can give it to them somewhere where they can learn and a good place to support. A lot of believers are going through a lot of anxiety. They're born again, but they're going through a lot of troubles and a lot of anxiety because they're either ignorant or arrogant of the plan of God. And when you try to help them, they resist, resist, resist. And that resistance that you see from them tells you why they're in the shape they are in. Arrogance has its own bed to sleep in. Ignorance has its own bed to sleep in. You say, well, where's the compassion? The compassion is to pray for them. The compassion, though, is not to agree with them. That's not the thing to do. But to help them in any way that you can, but also understand that what we cuddle to cuddles on us. What we, what we, there's an old saying, what you rub up against rubs on to you. And so I, we're always cognizant of these things. All believers need to be involved in obedient biblical worship, meaningful worship. Worship. The word itself means to honor the worth of another. Even though we should worship God individually every day of the week, because we are to do that, I believe that daily worship is superficial if we intend on missing the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. I believe that daily worship is superficial if we knowingly and intentionally dismiss the Lord's command to meet in the local church on the Lord's Day. It's different if you're on vacation or sick, something like that out. But it's not. that's not the way it is. God sets the standards. He's a loving God, but always, always remember what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God's going to carry out, including at the Bema seat. If believers have left their local church because they didn't offer the word the way they knew that they needed the word, then they are in a command to find a local church that teaches the word and they are to act to support and cooperate to the best of their abilities. As I think everybody in here has experienced that sometime in their life, myself included. If they're in a the reason I came and eventually came to this church and came back to this church after my wife and I exited the military, we went to another church that we were raised somewhat in. Uh, most of our life, but it was dead. There was no word being taught. It was just ritual and uh, just uh, just minimal activity, not activity in the sense that there was nothing going on to stimulate this brain of mine, much less my spirit. I was a saved man. When I asked the former minister before then to pray for my father when I got saved, when I was a youngster in that church, I asked the minister if he would pray for my father to get saved. He said, well, that's a, that, he'll be all right. Don't worry about him. He'll be okay. Well, the minister wasn't saved either. He wasn't saved either. I wanted to see my father get saved, and I told him I'd gotten saved, and he looked like he was talking to somebody from Mars because as far as that was concerned, I was from Mars because he was still from the earth. He was a man of the dirt, not of the cloth. He was a man of the cloth, but not of God's cloth. And so it wasn't long after we got out of the military, just a few weeks, migrated back here to a Bible teaching pastor. And that made all the difference. Made all the difference. If a person is in a location that does not offer sound teaching of the word, they're in a remote area, then they either need to move to where they can get it, or they need people move for a lot less. People migrate from one location to another with their, for their jobs, for their family, for their health. What about your spiritual welfare? I know of a church in Houston, Texas, where people flew their airplanes to Houston every week because they knew that that's where they would get the Word of God. It was a doctrinal teaching church that they knew the minister, they knew the teaching methods that he had, uh, and so they just flew their own private airplanes and some, like Barry Goldwater, would fly his jet down to Houston and go to the services because that's what they wanted. They wanted the Word of God. It meant more to them than what it cost them to get there. And so, or some would get on a uh, group and they would listen to the Word of God together uh, 
especially people in remote areas that couldn't didn't get it or places that did not provide it. And so that was very helpful. It wasn't a cult. It's almost like if you're teaching the Word of God, you're a cult now. You, you know that. It's a shame. They are in a location that does not offer sound teaching the word, then they need to move to where they can get it and stay as actively involved as they can, as, as we, we do. And you receive the message in so many different ways that are so helpful. But the believer who is striving for the crowns needs to be a part of a fellowship or a community of honest worshipers of the Lord, worshiping together in spirit and in truth. And I certainly believe that there are believers all over America and other places in the world that are doing that. Paul says in Romans 12, 1, that we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, that is giving God our reasonable or rational worship. From Romans 12, 1, what is obedient worship? <coughs> it's holy giving of ourselves, body, soul, and spirit to God every day of the week. This is not simply going through the motions of an organized worship or a liturgy in service. I've been in those churches. Some of you may have been. Have you, were you been in a liturgy and there was a responsive reading and then there was a prayer book and then there was an order of service with the lighting of candles and the certain mantras and, and, and different things repeated? Didn't learn anything. <laughs> I've been in services like that and all I got was creeped out. I always felt, I felt at that time I was in a cult. When there was supposedly a worship and the name of Jesus Christ was never mentioned. Where someone had to read the prayer because they didn't have enough spirit and heart and dedication to scripture to memorize one. Or to say what comes off. I don't write my prayers. The only time I ever wrote a prayer was when I did a dedication uh, for a memorial. I wanted to make sure that I didn't miss any points. <laughs> so it was more like a sermon that I read off of a three-by-five card <laughs> for just the prayers. But all the dignitaries that were on the platform, you know, the generals and the senators, I wanted to make sure that uh, they got a little, little sermon that day because that's not what I was there for. <laughs> but meaningful worship is much more than ritual and emotions at its core. It's giving back to God a thoughtful response of reverence and appreciation for who God is as we come to understand God and accept God. And you and I do not understand God just because we read the Bible. We only come to understand God when we accept in our hearts what the Bible says and it becomes our conscience. That is what God wants to have is our conscience pinging with the conscience of God. Ping. We're in tune. The old saying was our radio was dialed in at the same, on the same number. This requires a maximum intake and acceptance of truth as we find in the Bible to collectively. There's a right kind of music also for the church and it invokes reverence and reverential thoughts toward God. Praise and glory thanking God for things, yes, but never outside of the boundaries of reverence because otherwise you'll be dealing with the justice of God if you try to take on a form of worship of God that is unholy. The children of Israel dancing around the golden calf, which they had the calf erected to have as an image of God, became irreverent. There was a lot of irreverent things happening around the dancing of the calf because they also it invoked in them physical feelings that they had when they were worshiping the false gods when they were back in Egypt. And God was so displeased with that that he had Moses to melt the gold and make the perpetrators drink it. They all died. They had a gold cocktail because God was so incensed he was going to kill the whole bunch. And he said, well, at least Moses bring out the, the troublemakers and deal with them. They make me so mad I could kill the whole bunch, God said. And Moses pleaded with God to spare them. But he said, I'm still going to make those troublemakers stand. Uh, stand. And so one of Aaron didn't get it. 
because he was Moses' brother. But anyway, there's a right kind of music for the church. There, just because we're in the New Testament doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. And that's what a lot of churches think because of the Old Testament God they look at as an ogre, the New Testament God being a feminine hippie. They feel that, you know, we're to kind of be just free love, free love. Our Savior is not a 60s Jesus. He's God Almighty. He spoke that son out of his mouth. And it's a fearful thing to fall into his hands. And I would rather have a reverential fear of God than have this willy-nilly idea that Jesus is my friend and he's my bud. There is no scripture to support that. There's a lot of songs, but they're not biblical. So there's the right kind of music for the church, and it should invoke reverence reverence toward God but a fever pitched drum thumping loud instrumental invoke worship service which is usually a big promo for most Christian youth camps with repeated drum beats of chanting and sugary non-doctrinal theological thoughts non-theological thoughts it does not induce reverence toward God and it does not induce thought toward God it induces personally satisfying one's physical sensations which do nothing more than feed the flesh. Folks, that is not worship. That is the definition of idolatry. And a lot of worship services are nothing but idolatrous services. It's like the person who uses the Bible, like Satan used the Bible to try to trick Jesus Preachers and organizations often use the Bible to dupe ignorant Christians into following their things. That's how those people get involved in the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they get involved with the Latter-day Saints because the Latter-day Saints and the Jehovah's Witnesses deceitfully use the Bible as a con to draw people into their cults. We have to to be wise to these things. After the various hormones of those who have been in those worship services have returned to somewhat of a normal level, then everything in the rest of the service is anticlimactic. Can you imagine having a hopped up service and then I'll walk up on the stage and start doing the Greek text out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. They'll all either go to sleep or walk away or they're, they're checking their phone for something else to look at. They've got their YouTube channel up looking at YouTube uh, videos of cats playing the piano or something. Yeah. Everything else after everything is crunked up is anticlimactic. The preaching of the word to follow is only endured until the next musical is performed. What a pity. The church and its main purpose of edifying the body of Christ has been hijacked by a counterfeit worship. The spirit of Christ which speaks in that still quiet voice to his bride, the church, has been drowned out as the blind entertainer Ronnie Millsap used to sing his song, There's a Stranger in My House. Somebody here I cannot see. Remember that a blind man his wife and him are in the house, but he can know that there's a stranger in there too. Maybe not physical presence of another man, but he knew that there's another man in his wife's life. There's a stranger in my house, somebody here I cannot see, stranger in my house trying to take her away from me. And there is a stranger in the body of Christ trying to take the body of Christ away from Jesus Christ. And it comes in with a pied piper of a lot of this contemporary and foolish music. When you got people who are dressed up on the stage like ZZ Top, and they're supposed and they've got some of these most ungodly names for their bands. And this becomes the mindset of someone who thinks that they're worshiping God. That's crazy. When you have someone who keeps doing a continuous repeat of the same saying over and over and over again, you don't see a doctrine like that in the scripture. That is a psychological ploy to get your mind into a trance to where you're not thinking so that other things that are demonic can be invoked into your, and it becomes addictive. Your hormones become addictive to it. And that's why a lot of people go keep going back to all these people. And they keep listening to all these people. And then they demand it in their churches, that their churches now have that as a part of their music uh, uh, 
program because they're addicted to it outside of church. And I'm going to tell you where all that got started. It got started with the show of people like Charles Finley, Billy Sunday, and yes, Billy Graham. I loved them and certain things they did. But the idea became that it should be the local church that now picks up that idea of how to do church, how to do a worship service. And so many believers, especially baby believers in Christ, have been sucked into that because of their ignorance. And so many charlatans called preachers have taken that route. They've grown massive churches. The focus is not on the word. And I'm thankful that there's been some movements to come back away from that by those who were jaded, thinking that they were getting closer to the Lord. And actually, they're getting more closer to a nervous brick breakdowns what they were getting closer to. Ronnie Millsap sang in that song, Stranger in My House, trying to take her away from me. And I think Jesus Christ says there's a stranger in his church trying to take his bride away from him. The noise and theatrics created by instruments and multiple microphones and loudspeakers, all made by the hands of men, had introduced a stranger into God's house. One looking nothing like the glory of God and none that anyway looked like the Son of God. Stealing the attention of God's people away from the Word of God. So worship involves more than preaching, praying, meditating, singing, and giving offerings. So let's look at just a few things and we're going to wrap it up here. Evidence is the worship in God. Well, here's one. You're remaining Holy Spirit filled. Now these are personal evidences of worship in God. You remain Holy Spirit filled. That means you don't have any known unconfessed sins hanging on in your life. As Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, which is in excess, but be filled, present passive imperative, be filled with the Spirit. Number two, worship involves more than just preaching, praying, meditating, singing, and giving offerings, because you can do that at the house. You can do that in a barn down by the creek. It involves not forsaking the <coughs> assembly of the saints when it's time to meet for edification, Hebrews 10.25. That's an imperative mood, which is, means he doesn't give us an option. Yes, we all have times where there's the auction, the ditch. We may be caring for a loved one that has to have us there. We get that, but we always have to, for, <coughs> to push to get back to the right thing, not forsaking the assembly. Number three, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That is an outward manifestation of, or an evidence of worshiping God. You see, if I'm always causing a stink, then I'm not worshiping God. Ephesians 4.4, 4, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, cooperating, working with the saints, not being a, a person breaking up the church, but trying to mold it together in, in good brotherly love. Number four, judging our lives by the character of Jesus Christ. That's worship. Not judging our lives by someone else's life. That's Romans 8.29, being conformed or sumorphous to the image of Christ. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and judging our lives by the character of Jesus Christ. That's a form of worship. And then giving back in offerings, 1 Corinthians 16 to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. I may have left those in your notes. I'm not sure. Did I? Okay, good. And there's other verses, obviously, that goes with these. But these are examples. I didn't say they were exhaustive, but these are examples. But the wreath of righteousness is not awarded if I'm half-hearted. And obviously, God also on the other spectrum, side of the spectrum doesn't say that you're going to be a perfect and not still get the wreath. Because there's not going to be anybody that's a perfect believer. Paul wasn't a perfect believer. He, he had his missteps as well. He knew he had his sins to deal with as well. Sometimes he won out. Sometimes the sin nature won out. Romans 7 and other places as well. He had a form of arrogance that was hard for him to overcome because of his national pride. That's why he was just, you know what, bent on getting back to Jerusalem to take the offerings there. When three or four times he was specifically told, not only by a New Testament prophet and, and his friends, but also the Holy Spirit himself said, Paul, do not go back to Jerusalem. Well, he was, you know what, I'm going to go, you know what, or how, or, or how, what, or I'm going. 
His arrogance got him into trouble sometimes. He wouldn't have spent two years in Caesarea if he'd have kept his mouth shut and done what the Holy Spirit told him. He was not a perfect man. God told him not to go back and end up spending two years in Caesarea before, and under Felix's governorship before he ended up being put on a ship and being sent to Rome where he spent another two years under house arrest. He wouldn't have been in Caesarea if he'd have listened to the Spirit of God do what he told him to do, but he wouldn't listen. But he was, by the end of his life, he wasn't a perfect man, but he was expecting to get the crown of righteousness, and the Lord had gave him the confidence that he was going to get that. Hey, so if you haven't been a perfect Christian, there's still hope for you. There's still hope for me, I hope. But the wreaths as a whole would never be handed out, nor would they ever be offered as a reward for faithfulness if God expected sinless perfection of us. However, this wreath, as well as the others, does require the humility for us to confess our sins to God when we fall into sin, and we need to give ourselves to reach in maturity and holding on to being mature and not giving up on guarding the faith as we get more mature and older in the Lord and get down to the last uh, seasons of our life. We need to allow the will of God to wean us from our dependency and addiction to the world. And we need to allow the word of God to take us from despondency to truth. We need to consistently fight the good fight, stay on course, and keep the faith regardless of the inconveniences. We must not oppose the word of God in any way. And we should commit ourselves to serving only his divine will, not our own lust and our own pursuits. We have to make sure that we bow to him as being the Lord, not our body being our Lord, not our lust being our Lord, not our materialism being our Lord, not our arrogance being our Lord, but him. The great apostasy which the Bible prophesies to come at the end of the church age will separate winners and losers of these crowns. It will show the division. Now, there's believers who have passed on hundreds, if not almost 2,000 years. Two, for 2,000 years, believers have passed on. and But they'll have to wait on us before they can ever step up to get their crowns. So will Paul. He has to wait. We'll be gathered together in our group when that time comes. But God will be fair with us, but we need to be honest about ourselves and then also be honest about how we worship of the Lord as well. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and care for us. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the peace uh, that passes all human understanding. And we ask now that you would just give us grace and strength. Help us to just remember that we're here because of what you've done for us through Christ our Lord. For it's in his name we pray and we give thanks. Amen. Mm-hmm.